Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, like button, subscribe button, we'll move on. If you want to find us on YouTube, go to Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always tell you it's much appreciated. Today, I'm joined by Sam Fortier from the Washington Post as we dissect Washington's roster. We're starting with the defense. We get to the offense. We dig into problems. What, what Sam thinks about Carson Wentz. He wrote a story recently on Antonio Gibson and him losing weight. And he dig, we, he tells us a little bit more about that whole process. And then also some questions we have and some why, where are there reasons for optimism? So dig into all of that, just some good off season discussion. You can follow Sam on Twitter at Sam 4 TR. You can read his work, of course, in the Washington post, and you can read my work on ESPN.com. As a reminder, I am on vacation. So if there's any news, any breaking news, and you're not hearing it on here, that's the reason. So I just wanted to limit it to football discussions and there isn't gonna be any news. So now that you know that, let's get to my conversation with Sam Fortier. Well, Sam, before I get to the big questions about the commanders, I gotta ask about the fridge. Are you still like, are you learning your ABCs with all those magnets on there? Wait, you know, or is this is that how you're writing your stories now? Like what's going on with that? <laughs> uh, I just moved from Chinatown up to Parkview in DC. I, I now live with a couple of my college roommates and uh, we got some letters up to give each other a hard time. What I should have done is I should have spelled out, hello and welcome to my podcast. Because, <laughs> because I don't know if listeners know this, but in the side room, in the media annex, I heard that a bunch over minicamp. Well, I tried to be quiet, and somebody actually told me I need to speak up. I'm like, well, there are people on the other side of the room. <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't want, first of all, like, I, you got, I want you guys to click on there and download. I don't want to give you some free samples across the room. You know, I know how you are. You know, it's like, it's like you're not going to let me in on the paywall. I got to go buy that, right? Wow, I, I, that's a discount. I can't. I, I don't want to get, get in trouble with my employer, but I will say you were very worried, but it was muffled. It was it was no problem. Well, that's good, and I do appreciate like just so people know, Sam had a couple of interns out there. I thought it was cool how you made them carry your bags too. So I think that was that was always that was always cool. So that you know, I'm sure they were impressed by you know Sam Fortier. I'm carrying Sam's bag just like the rookies do for the vets, right? Absolutely. I feel like I'm getting a little bit of rookie hazing right now, but when you compare, you know, two years to what was it? 30 for you? Oh, I don't know. Just like Morgan Freeman. I lost track of time in Shawshank. <laughs> <laughs> a great movie. It is. And listen, when I had COVID that got me through one day, those three hours of Shawshank redemption got me through one afternoon when I had no ability to focus on anything like and thank God there's this. And so there you go. So I now I'm sure people are happy to know that. And they're happy to know about your letters and your interns and all that. Let's get to the good stuff. So we've gotten through all the spring workouts. I'm curious what your take is after now processing it, watching these workouts, knowing what they've added. Where do you feel this team is at? So one of my biggest takeaways has to be, you know, I think there are the obvious ones, right? Like Carson and his arm strength and what we've seen from there. Uh, I think, you know, the building up of the skill position groups. Uh, but to me, I think one of the biggest things was, you know, that they ultimately didn't go get that linebacker uh, that, that Ron Rivera talked about wanting in early May. They decided, you know, hey, we're going to roll through offseason workouts um, with just the guys that we got. Um, they have some undrafted free agent linebackers. Ron talked about, you know, the three guys that they've talked about, three guys they really like. They probably won't be able to keep all of them. And I know that we're talking about a little bit of down roster stuff here, but it was notable to me that Ron expressed a concern, then did not address it. Obviously they still could address that in training camp. He said veterans need, you know, not as much time to get up to speed. Um, but it was notable to me that when you saw people rotating through those Buffalo nickel spots, whether it be a veteran like Bobby McCain or, uh, you know, a little bit of a younger guy, like uh, that was notable to me. Right. And, and I think that's definitely notable. And I, you know, it's funny because I still think they could sign somebody but it's it's it seems like what they said in January, February, what you heard is a lot different than what you hear now. Agree? Absolutely. And and it's funny because Jamin Davis, you know, when we talked to him and, and I always hesitate to read too much into what guys are doing in, in shorts and, and helmets. Um, 
but Jamin seemed a lot more comfortable, not only on the field, but also with us. I thought like he just mm-hmm. seemed, you know, a little more relaxed talking to the media. Uh, and he mentioned, you know, he and Cole have talked about like, you know, Cole's going to be the mic. He, you know, someone asked him, Hey, do you feel more comfortable on the outside? And, and it was like, the look on his face was, oh. you know, very yeah. distinct. Yes. Like this is a much better spot for me. So even if he, um, isn't ultimately the guy they expect him to be, I think that he could take a little bit of a jump because he, he's allowing his athleticism to unlock rather than thinking and processing and moving a little bit slower. And I think some of that too, you go back to Kentucky and what they were asked the linebackers to do there versus what he's asked to do here is different. You've got to read a little bit more and read a little bit quicker. Whereas there, I think it's just more of a reaction off of what the linemen are doing. So it's a different game that you got to play and it does take a little bit of time. So, and I think like he could be a guy he's got to, he has to improve. For this defensive room, I think he's got to improve because he has that ability and he's a first round pick. You can't have a guy like that not contribute in a big way in year two. But I also think that he's going to be a steady progression and not, I don't think it's just going to click for him this year. What about Cole? What did you, because like he's the guy that I think is even a bigger key, but he at least steadily progressed throughout last year. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a huge part of this defense. And I think that Ron Rivera talked about coming into this. He didn't think that communication was one of Cole's strong suits. And when you talk about the middle linebacker, the guy with the green dot, obviously, you know, he, he is frustrated, I think, by these questions about, Hey, you know, what are you going to do differently? Because he was calling the defense from the outside uh, last year, uh, at least early on before that, you know, he kind of got more time at Mike, but um, I think that his development, his, the necessity for him to take the next step is, is going to be a huge part of this defense as well, because we know that linebacking position um, was a a weakness for them last year. Can he solidify that? Can he allow, you know, uh, the defensive backs and the defensive line, can he, can he bridge those gaps and allow those guys to not worry about that position? I think that's going to be a really huge part of this. And um, we can kind of delve into this a little bit more, but you know, the, the linebackers working in concert uh, with the DBs. I'm very curious as well to see how they end up figuring out the best way to utilize a man corner like William Jackson and a zone corner like Kendall Fuller, because, you know, you heard Ron say we want Benjamin St. Juice in the slot because we really like how Kendall plays with vision on the outside. So if you're going to do that, how do you find the right balance and the right scenarios of when to play, which coverage? And I think that's a good point because last year, early in the year, they played a lot more man. Their thought was you got four man rush. You got sweat young. You got pain and Allen. go get them play man behind them. They played more man early when the defense started. There was a stretch with like eight games. Where the defense played better, definitely better during that time. It's more zone. They went to back to more zone. And I think that's where fuller really, really came through. And so to me, Jackson has to improve in that area more than anything, because they are going to play that, I believe. And that's where I am curious, like for your perspective, like, do you think Jackson can can improve in that role with one year being there enough? Or some guys, sometimes some guys are just better in man. Yeah, and, and I would even, not to let him off the hook or absolve him, because he did struggle at times last year, but but I think that I think that he was misutilized at times, right? Yeah, because yeah. like, I mean, if you have, like, I kind of go back to that Saints game, um, why were they not using him like Marshawn Lattimore, where they say, okay, Marshawn, like you go shadow Terry and then we'll figure out uh, the rest. Or why didn't you, you do, that, do that a little bit more? Like for him dropping into those deep zones on, on third and long, I just, it was, it was a little confusing to me, but you know, I, I asked Chris Harris about this uh, last week um, at the end of minicamp. And he, he was really excited about, he called it a, a revamp of the defense um, and tweaking a lot of different coverages. You wouldn't go into too many specifics, but that to me is sort of what we're talking about here. Are they finding the right way, um, you know, to, to mix and match those coverages, to utilize those different skill sets? I, I, he compared it like a lot of quarterbacks do a lot of, you know, people learning a new playbook. He said for Will, it, it was uh, going from English to Spanish. He had to learn to refine that footwork. And it's not, you know, really, it's not super easy for a guy that played mostly man for his NFL career to start. So I, I think that, I think that Will will take a step. Um, it, but, but to me, it's, it's still a bigger question of, are they going to put him in the spots to be most successful? Yeah. And I think you could still see, I thought his comfort level was growing last year because again, they played more zone and the defense was better. So it's not like he was playing poorly. I don't, but he is more, he is better in man. And people who coach him in the past would tell you that. 
I think the one area where I would see it too with him, because you need to get, you need to understand how to play with vision with your eyes and the quarterback. That's different. So you would see, for example, Kendall Fuller and certain coverages would be seven or eight yards off the ball, right? Off the guy. For 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 Williams, sometimes it would be nine yards off the ball, eight, nine yards off the ball. So that one or two yards to get that extra comfort level and not give up something deep. But a lot of it too is just understanding concepts. If a guy's cut leaving your area, somebody's coming in just, and it sounds basic, but that's one of the things that I think that they said that you just have to get used to that. So, so I agree though. I think that was, that's why I know some people, while they thought Jackson was a good corner, they wondered how he's going to fit in a system that called for a lot of zone. So how they use him is a, it's you're right. That that's going to be a big key. Are you sold that they have depth at that position? No, I think like linebacker, you know, to me, who is, is that fourth corner? You know, is it, is it one of the veteran depth guys? Is it one of the younger guys? Could they still bring somebody in? I, I think the fourth corner and the third linebacker are, you know, putting aside the Carson Wentz, Chase Young, those kind of headline questions. If we're talking about how does this, how does this team solidify itself, protect itself against injury? You know, how, how are you going to get through this season? Those right now would be my biggest questions. Yeah. And then, Looking at safety, I think there's a similar issue there because we know, I think this, I, Cam Curl, I think he's going to have a really good year. He's looked good this spring. And what we see is a kid that continues to ascend. It's not like, because you know how some guys can look really good in the spring and you get into the August and September and you're like, still can't play, right? So we, we've seen that here. There are guys on this roster we've seen that with, um, but that's not the case with Cam. He's a guy who's played well each of his first two years and looks more comfortable this year. And I think Bobby McCain developed as well in this defense. Beyond that, it's a lot of young question marks. Yeah. To me, like this question is sort of like, how much do you buy the Ron hype of some of those younger safeties, such as Jeremy Reeves, obviously he had that hit on Deami Brown, but you know, I don't think that that is, uh, you know, disqualifying are going to be a big deal when we no, get but there. It cost but Ron hundred K. It did. It did. It, it certainly a uh, hundred K has been flying around at that facility. <laughs> Um, but I, but I would say like Ron has really, um, you know, I think been a, a strong proponent, vocal proponent of Jeremy so far this year. And, and my question is, is that real? I think we've seen him kind of pump some guys up and then ultimately, you know, things don't happen, whether it be Cam Sims or Kevin Pierre Lewis, or wow. some of these guys where they're depth guys, but, but he talks about how much they like them. And then they either don't play big roles or they don't re-sign him. So if you buy the Jeremy Reeves hype, I, I think he played well at the end of that 2020 stretch where he got, you know, he got some reps. Um, but do they trust him? And and then, you know, I would say like, if you're talking about a box safety, uh, what is the development of Derek Forrest? Um, it is a, uh, for, for him to be calling the punt team to look the way he does and wear number 22. I, I, it sometimes I just forget that that's not Deshays or Everett. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, for that guy, plays a little bit like that too, with the, exactly. a, the and I, I'll be honest, I think Mr. Forrest contributed that 100 K as well when we went out there, but go on. <laughs> yeah. So I would, I would say, you know, I know there are other guys in that mix, but those two, I think are the two biggest guys. When you talk about, um, you know, are you concerned about their safety depth is, is where do you think those guys are at? Right. And I think that's a key. It's not so much that, you're saying these guys can't do it. We don't know. Like yes. Forrest has, he, he was hurt last year for most of it. So you don't know where he's at. What we saw is a guy flashing a lot of times. And we know he's a guy who plays very physical and with a sort of an abandon, right? I don't want to say reckless because I want to see him more in a game with that, but he plays with an aggressiveness that could really be good if it's refined, I guess. And if he, you know, depending on plays with it, and then with Reeves, I think the issue, I think he's very smart. I, I think he's very tough. I've always liked him. But what do, where does that size leave him, right? You know, is, is he, is that going to be, continue to be an issue? Or does their stuff, could he overcome that with the continued development of, of understanding what he's seeing out there, everything? And then with Percy Butler, does he become something? They were excited about when they drafted him, but when does he become something? So I think there's, they could answer it in the affirmative but we just don't know. And so I think it'll be, that's definitely going to be a storyline offensively. Um, listen, when we're taping this, we don't know about Terry McLaurin's status for all, you know, by the time you hear this, maybe he's signed, maybe he's still unsigned, 
but he's still a part of this team. So um, when you look at the receiver core and with him, how do you assess that group knowing what they have now? Yeah, to me, I think we talked about the depth that this team had last year. I think that was like one of the training camp narratives. But to me, like, I, th I think they really have solidified that depth. And Jahan Dotson, um, I think, has, has you know, shown to be kind of that dude that, that they expected him to draft. I mean, or what they expected when they drafted him. I think his hands are solid. He seems like a polished route runner. Um, and, and then, you know, even, uh, you know, we talked about Cam Sims before. I, I, think, I think that they have a solid group of guys. And I think Deami Brown, to me, one of the most interesting things out of minicamp was Deami Brown talked about it was hard last year to maintain a love of the game coming from, I think the COVID aspect and not being able to be fully around your teammates in that way probably contributed to this, but he came from North Carolina where he was catching, you know, deep bomb touchdowns like every other play. And when you come to a league where, you know, it's more competitive and, and you aren't having that success early, I think it's easy to doubt yourself and, and to, you know, lose confidence. And he talked about this year, gaining that confidence, kind of like falling back in love with the process of the game. Um, and, and Drew Terrell, the receivers coach, spoke about that as well. Yeah. And so, you know, if they can get more of the Deami Brown that they thought they were going to get last year, um, whether or not Curtis Samuel remains healthy, you know, whether or not whenever Terry comes back, like I, I think this has the potential to be a really strong unit. I think with Deami too, he talked about being maybe less passive. He talked about that at the end of last season too. That's been a theme of his since we talked to him at the end of the season. And, you know, you see like Drew Terrell was talking about too, how he noticed in meetings him being a lot more, maybe not so much attentive, but his note-taking was better. His questions were better, which told him that this guy is starting to get it. Now you've got to take that to the field, right? But it's, I mean, but they are, their hope is that it's a guy who's maturing as, a, as an NFL player and it goes out there. So you know, but I, I do think like he could be a big play guy for them. I don't see him as like anything like a 50 to 60 catch guy, not, not with this talent around him, but I see him as a guy who could make big plays down the field for them. And there is speed on that, on that defense, or excuse me, on at the receiver. What are you expecting from Curtis Samuel? Are, are you concerned at all after, you know, they shut him down, abundance of caution, but this is this is like the biggest trap question I feel like that you could you could ask me, Con. I well, that's what I'm here for, baby. <laughs> I mean, like it's, it's I know, I agree, but I don't like we don't know it's, it's unfair to say we don't about because you don't know about injuries. But I think after last year and the stops and starts, I think everybody's gonna have a level of caution with him. Yeah, and I think that one of the big questions for me is if it isn't because I think that um Ron, for whatever reason, I don't think was fully upfront with us last year, right? About about his his surgery and things like that. So, to me, if this is indeed just soreness, if they are just doing it out of an abundance of caution, there's no external medical situation. To me, the question about what can you expect from Curtis Samuel is is a lot about where is he at mentally with this? Because he talked about last year, even coming back, even though he was fully medically cleared, he didn't trust it. He didn't trust the groin and and that limited his speed and I think early you know even though they're running routes on air like he he looked faster he looked like he was cutting harder you could just tell that there was a difference if he goes into camp and he is early 2021 Curtis Samuel then I think the expectations are lower but if he comes in and he puts it totally behind him and he's and he's in a good place mentally and he's doing what he did you know at early offseason workouts then I think the expectations rise and it's like then you start saying if Antonio Gibson has lost the weight, if Terry is there, you know, if you can start shifting around these pieces, then the ceiling gets higher. Um, but I think that we'll be able to tell even, I, I think that the early workouts in, in training camp will be indicative of where he's at. Right. And I think you're, you make a good point too, because I do think he was running better in that Falcons game last year, when he got a couple balls, like, you didn't see the explosiveness when he had to plant and go. You saw a guy at a gather, stop, go, and you didn't see it. Like, that's not the Curtis Samuel I know. So if, they, if he does show that, and we'll know too, like, I don't want to go overboard and panic on, on a guy because we don't know. We'll, but when they get to camp, if they're pulling him out every couple of days, I think that's when you start to say, you know, not so much is he going to be ready for the season, but how is this going to last? We don't know. And, you know, I'm not going to predict injuries or anything like that, but you, that's where it's like, we'll just have to see how they handle them there and how, like you said, how he's moving. 
Um, what are your concerns with like with tight end? Do you have concerns with that with with Logan Thomas's availability in question for the start of the season? Yeah, to me, I mean, this is sort of a, it, it's not quite at the level of, of the safety and, and linebacker, or excuse me, the corner and linebacker, you know, discussion we had earlier. But if Logan Thomas is not ready for the season and, you know, which would be totally normal, right? Like he tore ACL, MCL and meniscus yeah. in December. Um, so to me, like if he's not ready by week one, that's an indictment. Uh, that's not, it's not an indictment right. yeah. um, of him or, or, or the training staff or any of this process, but um, John Bates, I think, you know, did a lot at the end of last yeah. year to kind of assuage concerns that that position would be, you know, um, almost, you know, barren. Uh, he was, he's a great blocker, but I think that um, his receiving skills, I think surprised a lot of people. Cole Turner um, has made some athletic plays. He makes like an athletic catch, you know, once every three catches out there, um, kind of highlighting the uh, the catch radius that they they target. The when wide they catch radius, not just the catch. The wide. You got to do this when you do it. It's, good. it's wide catch radius. It's wide. Yeah. This this feels like this feels like a move that your son's going to do in Spain. I don't know if people <laughs> are listening can see it, but it's a uh, yeah. There you it's go. Like yeah. A, arms over not, your head. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not quite, but yes, I get the point. But yes, <laughs> but it is. But you're right about him, and then but it's more so after him. Again, it's just like at safety. You have Curtis Hodges, the undrafted tight end. You have, does Antonio Gandy Golden, does he, how does he progress at that position? Does Samus Reyes, we didn't get to see him much this spring. Does he progress? Because he's got to show something more as a pass catcher. Get it, show something where it's a little bit more natural for him. I think the blocking will be there. Or will the other part be natural for him? But he's also a special teams guy. So I wonder about that too. Offensive line, what do you, what are you thinking there? Yeah, I guess my biggest question there is just like, can you maintain the level of production that you got from Brandon Sheriff and Eric Flowers when, when you, you know, trade that out for Trey Turner and Andrew Murrow? Um, and, and, and then at center, you know, does Chase really come back on time and is he able to kind of stabilize that line at the, in the middle? Because I think, you know, you did nothing against Keisha Ismail, but when you're on your fourth center, that I think that took a toll. Um but to me, I think the depth of that unit, the coaching of that unit, I, I think that that is one of the least concerning units on this whole team. Um, just from what we've seen them the last two years, Wes Schweitzer, um, even if he does have to play center in the beginning, I, I think he's proven to be a really competent, solid, um, you know, interior lineman for them. So uh, I, I think that obviously they were really, really good running the ball. If you look at the metrics or the tape, I think they both say that, this team was a really effective run blocking unit. If you have a quarterback like Carson Wentz, who, who likes to, you know, hold on the ball a little longer, throw it deeper, scramble around, how will that affect your pass blocking unit? Uh, but I think that would, those would be, you know, my, my main takeaways for that unit. And I, by the way, I really like Wes Schweitzer when he run blocks, because he goes out there trying to kill somebody. <laughs> and I really like, when he was at center, it was like, he, I thought he did a really nice job in that area. The run game. You wrote a story recently on Antonio Gibson, about, you know, just the, and Chef Mel. I mean, people who have listened to me know Chef Mel. He's been on here a number of times. So you incorporated Chef Mel into your story. What did you learn about what Antonio has gone through um, in terms, just trying to get to this point with, with his body and all that? Yeah, I, I learned that he really did not like where his body was at at the beginning of last year. I mean, he showed up to training camp, he told me at 2.36. Um, he was kind of, between the mid two thirties and, and maybe the upper two thirties uh, toward the end of the year. Um, and so like, that is, you know, that's a guy who, when you look at that, you know, I was talking to him, when did you see that weight show up the most? And he said that Buffalo game where he took that screen 73 yards to the house. Yep. He said, the fact that I even almost got caught at the end, just, just frustrates me still to this day. Cause that's not me. And like, when I hear that he was doing that at like 236 pounds, uh, I mean, th that was pretty impressive, but uh, obviously by the end of the year, you don't want to be that. You want to change your body composition. You also wrote about Antonio's uh, transition, kind of remaking his body, slimming it down. Um, Randy Jordan, the running backs coach, told me that like the first day Antonio came in for offseason workouts, he saw it in his face. He said his yeah. face just, you know, looked a lot slimmer. And that's a credit to Antonio. He did a lot of work. Um, well, that's what I want to talk about that work, too talk about good lord i'm gonna find myself for that one <laughs> but 
that work that he put in because it's not easy to just eat what he was eating. You have to give stuff up. And anybody who's ever tried to diet or give something up, you know that there's always that, that feeling of temptation. So what did he go through in terms of doing that? What was the work like for him? So with Chef Mel and, and Craig John, a local, um, you know, a local doctor, he basically started with an 11 day liver detox, um, which, you know, he, he basically cut out all animal protein. He did this like uh, pretty intense regimen. Uh, he said he was like getting lightheaded in workouts because, you know, he was consuming so few calories. And, and I mean, for a dude that's 230 pounds, right. like if you're eating only vegetables and protein shakes, like that's not getting you where you need to go. No. Um, after that, reincorporated some of the animal protein, um, you know, had basically tried to uh, cut down on the inflammation that was going on in his liver because that was affecting how he was able to process, you know, fats, proteins, and carbs. Um, so he, this might be a little bit more than you, you want to know, but uh, certainly a, a pretty intense regime. I think he did it for about a month and a half um, while he was out in Katy, Texas training. Um, and just really has tried to maintain those healthy eating habits, staying away from, you know, the, the candy, the, the processed refined food and trying to keep it more organic so that his liver can process so that his body can kind of um, get him in the shape that he needs to be in. Because when you talk about that guy to, to find out that he, you know, he was a thousand yard rusher last year when he wasn't his best self. Um, if he's going to come in uh, and, and, and I want to, and I also want to point out that I don't think that like, losing weight means faster for a guy right. like Antonio, um, who, who seems to have more of a, a power based speed. He trained at Exos, um, which we, I think we've talked about right. and, and they say, they would tell you he's a power. He's not a twitchy speed guy. He can be powerful. He can be twitchy, but he has a power based speed. So to be at 20 225, 230, that's okay. Um, but he just needed to body recomp and, and make sure all that weight was working for him. Scott Turner said, you don't want that bad weight, which he had last year, which was working right. against him. Right. And I think that's a good point that it is the bad weight. The other thing he was working on too, is that, is that short area cuts. So like they would set up, um, the, the trainer would set up like five foot hurdles and set up strategically. So you had to cut in through there, but you got to stay down while doing it. And then I think that Randy Jordan was talking about how he felt like he was setting guys up a little bit better with his eyes. And you see, when you start to hear guys getting the quote unquote home run runs, it's when they're able to block is right here, but you're looking down there because you know, this is taken care of. You're already looking one step ahead. AP would always talk about that guy. You know, I don't know. This is what they're saying now, how it translates in the season. I don't know. But that's also a guy is will, does he get comfortable enough to maybe hit a few more homers as a back and, and you know and, we'll, and that's that's something to me that I want to see. And one other point to that, I think obviously being in the offense, learning, seeing these different types of runs and making them it has been important for the first two years. The thing I think that contributed possibly to the weight, possibly to the injury, and he he's he's acknowledged this, and and even maybe to picking up the position a little bit slower than he would have liked to was last year with those hip and toe injuries, he was getting very few practice reps, some weeks, none at all. Right. And right. so if he can stay healthy, if he can get those reps in, uh, I think that'll even help him take another step. And I, and I don't think that that's overly optimistic. I think that's just logical. Right. And I think that's where Brian Robinson helps him. A guy who can spell him once in a while and, and you know, you, you're having issues with your shin, then you can um, sub him in. Right. And the other thing would be the fumbles. And I know that his side would say with those, some of those fumbles were stemming from him worrying about the shin getting hit and not worrying about the protecting the ball. So he worked with carrying a weighted football around or when he was carrying the ball is like a three pound ball and the ball weighs usually about what one pound, something like that. Not a substantial difference, but enough to feel it. And that was the whole point. So, I, you know, I'll see how curious how it translates to, to again, the season last thing quarterbacks, your takeaway on Carson Wentz? Yeah, I mean, other than just the the things which we've said before, which is, you know, the arm strength stands out. To me, it seems like he is developing a nice rapport with Jahan Dotson. Um, and, and I think that uh, his – it's funny, right? Because like, he's making all the throws. It doesn't look the, it, it with Taylor, with Alex, with a lot of those dudes, it looked different, a second level, a third level throw his, it looks almost the exact same. And we, there's been a lot of talk. I, I feel like about, you know, the, the off the field stuff with the Carson Wentz things that in Indy, in Philly, things that we haven't seen um, are, are the things that haven't come up yet. Right. right? Like 
he's making the plays. I think he's showing the leadership to me. Like we don't have the information yet about whether he can reverse course, whether he can defy the things that ultimately I think sunk his time in the, his last two stops. Right. Like, is he, can he take hard coaching? Can he own it when, when, you know, his play suffers, like those responding, those things, we won't find out until the season. Right, right. Um, but I mean, he looked pretty good. He, he looked like a very physically talented quarterback. And it, you know, as Ken Zampezi would say too, you don't want to go in there judging a guy with it either. And I don't want to just follow a narrative with him either. Like, Oh, this is who he is. And this is who God, people can evolve. And so like, will he, that's what I want to see. Will he? So, you know, I don't want to go in there judging him and assuming that he's the same guy he was several years ago. I, I mean, you know, I know it, you know, now that I'm 35, I know I'm not the same as I was at 30. So, <laughs> so you don't have to laugh that hard. I don't know, man. That was pretty funny. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? You don't want to prejudge the guy. You don't want to just follow a narrative with him. Right. And and I don't mean to like jump on the narrative and say, no, oh, you're this not. Is you're happen. staying away from that. That's what right. I'm saying. I, I think I think that like this is the information that we have previously. And we, right. we're, we're waiting to find out, does this translate? And to me, I, I don't know if I've said this with you before, we've, if we said it on the pod or on the sideline, but, you know, his relationship with Scott Turner, I think, is going to be instrumental obviously Ken Zampezi will be important but Frank Reich in Indianapolis talked about Carson really likes to do things his way there's a certain there was a certain amount of tension right. that that Frank Reich had to get comfortable with where if he thought Carson should have audible the protect you know audible one way or, or changed the protection or um done a certain thing and Carson really strongly didn't believe he should have done that like how do you exist with that tension and can you exist in that space without it compromising your relationship obviously with Frank Reich uh, you know, the guy that, you know, I think obviously brought him up in Philly and, and I think, you know, made him have some of the best years of his career. That was a very stable, strong, confident relationship that, that Frank Wright could have with him. Scott's new with him. How are they going to mesh? That's a, That's a huge question for me. And it's, it's a really good point because you have to be on that quote unquote same page. And it does take some time and it takes time for Scott to learn him. It's going to take time for Carson to learn Scott and how they both go about things. And again, that's, that's where some of the pumping the brakes on things is the little transition that everybody's got to make in a new setting. And also Chase Young coming back from any injury, Logan Thomas, you know, those, those things, how do they impact? Like you look on paper and think like this team could win 10 games, right? I mean, you know, but you, but how do those other things play out? Now every team has something like that for the most part. But for here, that's part of what it is. And it's the developing the relationships. And, and I think, you know, you know, I think they feel good about where things are at right now. But until you get in those games, and I remember one time it was, oh, I think it was Deion Sanders back in way back in the day. Um, they were, gosh, that was way back in the day. Do you remember Deion Sanders as a player? I'm just trying to flash back to like three minutes ago and you said you were 35. Yeah, well, you know, just, yeah. There you go. So, but anyways, so it was like, they, they had a, they had a team in 1980. They were eight. I think they were like, you know, they were started off pretty well and then they struggled, but it was, you know, it looked like you guys had good chemistry and his comment was, you don't know if you have chemistry until you get punched in the mouth. And then when they got punched in the mouth, they didn't respond. So that's how every, that's for every team that, that I've ever seen is when you know you have it is when that happens. I'd say for every player, that's the case with quarterbacks. How do they respond to an interception? You throw an interception, what do you do the next series? And that's the one thing that, again, that's what we'll learn with this. And, and how, how, again, how, like you said, how those two work together will be one of those underlying stories for the season. And to kind of go conversely, I think that this team cannot respond to adversity until like week six or week seven. And what I say, you know, what I mean when I say that is, Ron Rivera teams, not just in Washington, but previously have had struggles at the beginning of the year. And you put yourself in a, you know, like in 2020, a two and seven position where you got to have a bunch of things go right. And you got to win a bunch of your games at the end to make the playoffs. I think with this team, you got to show that progress. You got to show that step forward early, especially considering right. you get Jacksonville and at Detroit the first mm -hmm. two weeks. I think starting fast is important for every NFL team in every game and every season. Right. But for me, for this team coming off the year that it just had, I think the start and, and considering the schedule it has starting fast will be extremely, you know, it will be tantamount this year. If they don't start fast this year, 
there are going to be problems. And that's to say they couldn't recover, but you can't, you can't start slow against Jax. I mean, that's, I'd say no disrespect, but it kind of is disrespectful <laughs> because like, you know, I mean, you, you, if you have Jacksonville at home, the season opener, you got to win that game. And Detroit, if you want to be a good team, you fancy yourself an NFC East contender for that division title, you got to go win that game. You know, otherwise, like now then you go lose that game, questions start to get asked. And, and I don't think you want to face those early. And that was, that's one of my things is how do you start faster? And I thought if you're not going to play your starters a lot in the preseason, get those joint practices. I think the problem with staying in Ashburn for training camp is you can't, it's really hard to have them in Ashburn. And I know they didn't like being in Richmond because it was just for Ron, it was just too all over the place. You wanted a confined area, but that's one way you could help yourself to learn more about your guys. So you're not spending the first three or four games learning about guys. You already know them. But having said that in the third year, you should have a good handle on that. So are you last question then got two minutes. Are you more or less optimistic or about the same after going through the spring watching them? I, I would say I'm about the same. I don't think that there was any major development that, that showed me that, hey, you know, this offense is, is going to take a real leap. And uh, I think Chase and Logan and some of the injured guys we've talked about have, are probably on the same timeline that we expected. So I, I would say that I am pretty much at the same level. And, and when we come back from summer, um, you know, some of the questions we talked about with Curtis Samuel, will Antonio Gibson maintain his lean body? You know, it's easy to do it when you're there. Can you do it when you're on your own? I think some of those big questions to me will get answered um, pretty early on in, in late July, July and early August. Tell people where they can find you, Sam. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sam, the number four, T-R-S-A-M, the number four, T-R, and in the Washington Post. There you go. Sam, always enjoy having you on. People go read him, follow him. He's a smart young man. And there you go. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, John. Another kind young man. <laughs> Be five, baby. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Sam for joining me. And thank you, as always, for listening. Next week, I'm going to start a tour of the NFC East. I'm going to talk to my NFC East colleagues from ESPN. I'm going to start with Todd Archer in Dallas. Get his thoughts, not only on the Cowboys and Micah Parsons and Dak Prescott, but what he thinks of what the commanders have done this offseason. I'll talk to you next time.